Carmita. Ready. Do I do I start? Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. We'll wait a few minutes. Sorry about that. We we're having some uh, technical difficulties. Should be just a couple seconds. All righty, getting there. Okay, uh, just one more minute and we'll get started. And apologies for the slight delay. Uh, just having internet troubles. Molly, are you recording? I haven't started it yet, but I, I'll oh, start okay. it when you, Rob starts to introduce. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Go ahead and go for it. I'm going to get started in just a sec. Let me know when you're recording. Okay. Well, yeah, we're recording. Right, great. All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome you to this morning's uh, lecture for Physical Biology of the Cell 2020, uh, pandemic edition. And uh, I'm very happy to have the opportunity to introduce Professor Armita Nur Muhammad from the Department of Physics at the University of Washington. So as usual, I'll start with uh, some of the relevant facts. So our Armita um, studied physics as an undergrad at the Sharif University in Tehran. And um, if you ever have the chance to talk to her, I would have really been very happy actually had we had the sweat box today because um, I think she has very interesting insights into um, physics for young women in Iran and in a way that I think is profoundly interesting. And, uh, it's a pity that people won't have a chance to talk to her about that. But anyway, so that was uh, already a, a really interesting background. And then she went from there to the University of Cologne, where she studied with uh, Michael Lassig, who's a great friend of mine and, and, and ours, and somebody who's really, I think, uh, one of the deepest thinkers that we have in the world of statistical physics and how it meets biology. And I mean that with all sincerity. And then after that, she was a uh, Lewis Sigler Fellow, if I remember correctly, at Princeton. Um, I'm not sure how long she was there, but you know, maybe five years or so, which is roughly speaking an independent fellowship. So, you know, a pretty risky thing to do at the postdoc stage. And then after that, got a, a job both at the University of Washington in physics and also as a, a Max Planck Institute director or something, uh, I believe in Göttingen, um, if I have my facts straight, but you should correct me, Armita, if I'm wrong. Um, Aronan and I were really very happy to have Armita join the course this year. She was going to be one of our faculty members and the students that would have been in the course would have been greatly lucky to have been able to hang out with her. Um, she's a lot of fun, um, super sharp and works on extremely interesting problems. And, you know, over the years, I've just uh, very much enjoyed my interactions with her and uh, learned quite a lot. And so, as I mentioned yesterday, the sorts of things she does have, have to do with uh, statistical physics and how it touches on evolution. And uh, as you can see from her title, she's going to tell us about coevolutionary processes in the adaptive immune system. And so with that, Armida, I'm going to turn it over to you. And um, again, a little apologies for uh, being on my iPad or on my computer and I may duck out. Um, so, but anyway, we'll, we'll notify you with questions as they come up also. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, thanks, Rob, Hernan, and Molly for uh, for arranging this. And hello, everyone. Um, uh, it's a pity I ca I can't uh, meet with you in person, um, but I hope uh, we're gonna have a very active discussion. So please ask questions as we go uh, about the talk. So. Logistically, I was not a director at Max Planck, but I was in Göttingen. I was a Max Planck research group leader, which is a junior, pro uh, well, I am still um, a junior position there. Uh, but I, I am spending most of my time these days in Seattle at the University of Washington, 
uh, where you see the beautiful uh, Mount Rainier here. Um, well, these are a uh, few days of the year that we get sun and the view of the mountain. And so we are really enjoying it despite the pandemic. All right, let's get to it. Um, I'm, I wanted to base, oh, okay. I wanted to um, tell you a little bit sort of broadly what my group works on. It's not all about co-evolution uh, of the immune system to give you a sense of, you know, what the statistical physics is good for uh, when looking at biology. And I truly think that it's the right language to describe biological systems with many degrees of freedom as we know it. And uh, as Rob said, I did my PhD that's, uh, with Michael Lessig on topics in evolutionary biology and where they meet the statistical physics. And that's basically where I entered this field. That's why, I, that's how I'm primed in way of thinking about biology. Um, so one of the topics I'm interested in um, is evolution of gene regulation or gene expression levels at the level of gene gene interactions. And we've been looking at sort of building various evolutionary models and trying to look at data at the same time, try to do inference of um, evolutionary pasts that have shaped our regulatory networks or gene expression interaction networks um, that we see. So this is one of the sort of topics that we are looking at these days. Um, a bit sort of on the experimental side, we are, uh, I'm working uh, with a wonderful collaborator, Yannick Wondeles, and a student that, uh, who is now working in uh, Yannick's lab, um, Vincent, uh, in Paris uh, at the ESPCI. And we are looking at sort of experimental evolution at the very uh, basic level and trying to build in vitro uh, setup to drive an evolutionary process of uh, DNA polymerases, self-replicating DNA polymerases in a very sort of um, complex setup uh, with microfluidics and all, all the fancy experimental setups you can put together. And uh, I'm not doing the experiments, but it's been quite, uh, it's been a lot of fun uh, learning about these experiments. And we are trying to understand what are the advantages of uh, translation on noise uh, evolutionary advantage of translational noise in this setup if you are trying to do rectal evolution. On the theory side, something that I'm very, very excited about, um, and uh, it's sort of trying to build toy models of directed evolution and uh, basically artificial selection, I would call it a, the pink cow problem. And the idea is, can you mon can you control? How can you optimally control uh, evolution as an outsider? And so, uh, a lot of work has been going into sort of art building artificial selection protocols, and that's what we are also very interested in. Um, so, imagine you have uh, two subpopulations of cows, uh, uh, pink cow and uh, and white cow, but uh, you really want to have pink cows, but you also want to uh, the milk not to be pink. So in general, you have a high dimensional phenotypic space and you want to select uh, sort of various phenotypes in a population uh, that uh, may cause some trade-offs and they may co-vary with each other in ways that you're not um, very interested in. And so you want to find trajectories to drive this evolution in this high dimensional space. So that's... Um, problem uh, that we are really working on and building on sort of control theory ideas from engineering and also statistical physics into evolution. Uh, another thing that uh, somewhat related, but maybe more practical um, than, than pink cows uh, is to think about control in terms of therapy and evolving viral populations uh, and HIV in particular and building optimal uh, therapies with this super powerful, broadly initializing entities to control HIV. So this involves both modeling and also collaboration with our um, experimental colleagues, um, uh, Florian Klein, who do these experiments in mouse. Um, and uh, again, getting more closer to the topic of today, 
Another thing that we are interested in is trying to learn basically how immune system and pathogens interact with each other. At the end of the day, these are um, receptors uh, of immune system are proteins and a lot of targets are proteins. So we are actually asking uh, about how protein, so the space of protein, protein interactions and um, how this lock and key problem, which is at the structure problem actually work. And to learn this, we are adapting a lot of ideas from machine learning and uh, you know, protein science uh, using data, functional measurements of data here from deep mutational scanning that is uh, done here in Seattle. Um, trying to sort of build up what is known as immune shape space and trying to predict uh, antibody antigen or immune receptor antigen interactions. That's a, sort of, that's a project that um, it's a recent startup in our group and uh, we are quite excited about it. But the topic of today um, is a bit different. Uh, so I've been working on this for a few years now. Uh, it's about uh, basically trying to think about our adaptive immune response, uh, B cells and T cells, so antibody production, for example, in our body as an evolutionary process uh, that on one hand is driving evolution of pathogens around us. Um, so as you know, we get, uh, well, you, all, you probably all know quite a bit about the immune system given, uh, given uh, what we see in the news every day. But before that, you know, we get vaccinated every day for every year for influenza, the vaccines change every year. And the reason for that is uh, the virus escapes the sort of population level immune challenge. Um, and you need a new vaccine to trigger new immune responses. And so this is a, an example of basically a co-evolutionary co arms race that usually is shown as Alice and Red Queen. And so one population can be thought as Alice and the other one is Red Queen and they are running after each other, chasing each other without more or less changing the distance between them. Now, this is just sort of um, maybe a silly cartoon, but it's an interesting way of thinking about it. Now, uh, it turns out that there's a lot of interesting sort of evolutionary dynamics going on in our immune system when, um, when the immune system is trying to respond to pathogens. Uh, as sort of you can see from this whole slide, um, the true evolutionary process, you know, long term over millions of years of evolutionary process is the example of gene expression. If you think about directed evolution, we are basically using up evolution as a technique to drive some optimal uh, molecular feature in, in an experimental setup. So it seems that evolution or sort of natural selection uh, is a good protocol to get good things out of a uh, of an dynamical system. Now, why not? Uh, so, immune system that have uh, that basically is activated during our lifetime and needs to respond rapidly responds to pathogen during our lifetime. Also, is using evolutionary processes to do this efficiently, and that's one of the things that we are interested in, and we are interested in quantifying this and modeling this process. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. All right, let's give an overview of more or less how the immune system works. Uh, so we know we have a lot of pathogens out there and this is a bunch of examples that make their way on glossy journals. I should have put um, SARS-CoV-2 given, uh, given the circumstances, but the slide is a bit old. Uh, right, and also, you know, all the bacteria in our gut microbiome and all these things. And our immune system is basically need to deal with all of these pathogens. And that means that we need to have many, many diverse receptors to um, counter the diversity of pathogens that are out there. Now, uh, we exactly do that. We generate this very diverse receptors on B and T cells. These are the cells of the immune system. Uh, and 
you know, most of our cells have identical DNA, but these cells have encoded, the DNA level encodes receptors that genetically are different from one another. So they have really unique receptors. And they can express unique receptors on their surface. So each cell is different from another B cell. And as a result of that, you can select for, you know, successful B cell receptors that um, counter, let's say, influenza at a given year and mount a specific response. You can also keep a memory, and that's the whole point of vaccination, keep a memory of interaction with influenza uh, antigens in, let's say, in your vaccine and uh, use that memory more efficiently or mount that memory more efficiently in future encounters. So that, these are all the sort of interesting features of the immune system that we're gonna uh, touch upon um, in this talk. Uh, so B cell receptors uh, can also be secreted in the blood so they can get detached from the membrane and that's what we call antibodies. So the term that you're mostly familiar with. Now, given immune response, um, then the virus basically or the, any pathogen could in principle escape and that's us, this sort of um, bread queen story of the virus changes, the immune system now needs to mount new responses or change what it already had. And so it's a sort of circle of life that goes on. All right. Now, as I said, right, so we have Alice and Red Queen. Now, so the immune system interaction or escape with uh, an escape of pathogens can happen at two levels. And they're going to talk about both today. Uh, on one level, you can think about a population level immune response. So if you think about influenza, for example, uh, if someone gets infected with influenza, it's about a week or two of infection and then the virus moves to another host um, during this infection period. And um, so basically the virus is experiencing many, many different versions of an immune response to it because every person produces its own uh, antibodies in a sense, and T cells and B cells. So overall, you, you can think about it that at the population level, there is some sort of general immune response that is averaged across all individuals in there. And that drives the evolution of influenza for another year and another year. Then there are other viruses like HIV that, um, that have a different life cycle. They go chronic. So a person infected with HIV can basically live for the, with the virus uh, for many, many years. And during this time, HIV can evolve within a patient um, with evolutionary rates that are higher than global evolution of influenza. Uh, and during this time, the immune system is basically chasing the virus and producing new antibodies as we move on and uh that's that's what uh that's basically a long-term chronic response um to an evolving virus within one individual and each individual will have a different type of response to the virus so this is one of the topics that i'm very interested in because you would have a chance to actually look at one person over a very long period of time and track this immune response and the evolution of this immune response over time. And we're going to talk about this. Okay. To, to give you sort of an overview of how these receptors are formed and uh, how the diversity is shaped in our immune system, let me give you some numbers uh, and the mechanism at play. Uh, the first step in this mechanism is you start off with basically a bunch of uh, genes known as V genes, D genes, and J genes. And this works for B and both B and T cells. And so these genes are somewhat, I mean, they're encoded in the genome and they're somewhat different at the sequence level of, with, from each other. So different V genes are slightly different from each other, different D genes are slightly different, and different J genes are slightly different. Then what happens is um, you take one of these J genes and one of these D genes and put them together, and then you add a V gene. And given the numbers of different sort of the, the combinatorics of this process, basically, you, you can produce like about a few thousand sequences. 
and uh, then you know you're good. Uh, you you could say you made a receptor, and with quite a bit of diversity, but that's not enough. Then the um, insertions and deletions that happen at the junctional region, so between D and J and between B and B, so there are sequence insertion and deletion, and these are random but in a biased way. And we're going to learn about these biases uh, in principle from data. Uh, so that adds a further amount of diversity. So you can just modify these receptors at the junction. And um, on top of that, what happens is that now you have a receptor. And there's a good likelihood for this receptor to react to self-proteins, or what we call self-antigens. And that's pretty bad because you know, that triggers autoimmunity. Indeed, uh, you know, a very large fraction of these receptors are really uh, not useful. Uh, either they are very self-reactive or they don't bind to anything. So what happens, for example, in T cells, once you generate these receptors, they undergo something called thymic selection, that their receptors get tested against self-antigens, a pep little peptides from our self proteome. And if a receptor binds very strongly to self, it's, it gets deleted. If it gets, uh, it binds basically very weakly to everything. It's probably not just not a good protein anyway. So that also gets deleted. So you sort of uh, narrow the window of selection to and limit it to um, receptors that seem to work okay. They're not very self reactive and they bind to something. Uh, so in time, so th that happens in B cells as well, and it's called the process of um, central tolerance. And as a result of that, in B cells, for example, you can produce, in principle, up to 10 to the 18 sequences. That's a lot of different receptors. And our B cell population is about 10 to the 12, uh, depending on um, you know what organisms you look at. Um, something around there. So basically, the space of possible sequences, this 10 to the 18, is way larger than what we, our body could in principle sample. So each immune system, in a way, is a subsample version of the potentially generated receptors with an overlap between individuals that is very, very small. That's kind of interesting thing to think about. So you, you start with this sort of random process of generating receptors and you produce sequences and you do it very differently from one individual to another. I have a question about that. So yeah. um, that means that when we mount a response against polio or measles or influenza or whatever, meaning all of us are subjected to the same exact pathogen, mm -hmm. the success story will be different for each person is what you're saying. In other words, if I somehow were to look at what the, uh, the assembly of antibodies are and T cells and B cells that were marshaled against that attack, your point just now was that they have chosen different ways from within the big space to pull it off. And part of the reason I find that interesting and a little weird is lots of times, you know, like coat color in mammoths and mice ends up being the same mutation, it turns out, yeah. even though they're separated by you know, a huge evolutionary distance. Anyway, yeah, so I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. Yep, so the answer is yes and no. Um, the, so I'm gonna talk about, you know, the biases in this generation. So this 10 to the 12 and 10 to the 18, they are, you know, just numbers, but these receptors are generated with widely different probabilities. There are very many rare receptors and also a lot of common receptors. So the common receptors are likely to be shared among individuals. So if you happen to use a very common receptor to respond to polio, then probably most individuals will carry that receptor and use it. If, if the receptor is rare and hard to generate, then each person has a different response to the virus. And we see that. So if you look at sharing of receptors, among individuals um, in a large cohort, uh, you, you can basically say, okay, I know the probability of generating this receptor and I can calculate it somehow. And I'm gonna talk about this a little bit. 
And I can estimate what's the probability of this receptor being generated independently in two different individuals and being shared between them. And so that gives you more or between you know, 10 individuals. And for res some receptors, this probability is non-zero, right? There, you can have these receptors. And uh, it's, the data seem to be pretty consistent with that. So I'm not sure, I don't have a slide for that, but uh, we, we see that there are a lot of receptors that are shared. And recently we were looking at uh, some COVID data that I'm gonna show you. And we saw basically, you know, receptors that were shared among individuals and seem to be responding uh, to the same virus, more or less. And that, that's, that's a good thing. Uh, that means that there, is, there are some easy sort of answers to COVID, but there are also a lot of rare receptors that individuals will have a sort of individualized response and use them. But overall, I think at the sequence level, there is quite a bit of heterogeneity when you look at the population, so at the population but they have the same phenotype. So they encode for the same key, so to speak. Um, or lock, depending on which view you take. Um, yeah, so at the end, this is a protein that needs to be folded, and you can fold the same protein uh, with different sequences in a common way. You can form the same shape. So just, um, yeah, so both happens. Uh, yeah, but, but it's a fascinating thing. So the amount of sharing is very small overall. Um, but there are common things that are shared. So there's a okay. there's actually another, there's another question which I think is a good question. It's related. <laughs> um, sorry, excuse me. Um, Go ahead. Which is what decides the probability of generation of the receptors in the cell? So <clears throat> it's something that um, sorry I've got something in my throat, but it's something that you've thought about and we have too, which is you know the frequency of gene usage of D, V's, D's, and J's, which I think yeah. is a hard problem, yeah. but. Maybe, maybe you want to give your thoughts on it. Um, if you wait in the slide, I'm going to get into it. Sounds Try good. Do that. Yep. Uh, all right. But frequency of V and D and J's is one of these things. Um, they are strong biases, uh, which V and D and J you use uh, in a nutshell. So the, the type of insertion and deletion, I said it's random, but there's sequence biases. So the types of amino uh, nucleotides that get inserted or deleted, there's bias there. You add up all these biases in there and can calculate the probability for a receptor to be generated. Um, right, so this process basically can generate a B cell receptor or a T cell receptor for you. But B cell receptors, Further diversify. So I should, I should add this point. I should have probably put it on the slide. So there, you can think why the immune system needs both B cells and T cells. So there's sort of an interesting thing about it. So B cells can basically bind to everything, but they interact with the surface of the antigens. So they can just go and interact with like whole virus and like bind at the surface, neutralize it, keep it from entering the cell. Um, so antibodies could do that, or B cell receptor could do that. But T cells, they are very restricted to, like the targets of T cells are very restrictive. They bind to uh, short peptide fragments, something around nine to 12 amino acids, depending on which cell is presenting that. And these peptides are basically chopped parts of a protein. And given that the protein is a 3D structure, it's more likely to uh, that that this chopped pep peptide comes from the inside of the protein and the outside. So you can think that T cells basically recognize the inside of the protein or a molecule, and B cells are basically mainly detecting the outside. So they're sort of complementary in some ways to each other. And B cells um, are more versatile and they can bind to many different types of molecules, not only proteins. You can bind to lipids, everything you can think of, uh, whereas T cells are restricted to peptides. So this process of generating these receptors um, produce some amount of diversity, a bit larger in B cells than in T cells. Uh, but as I said, B cells need a bit more diversity and um, adaptability 
And that's the second process that comes in play that looks really similar to uh, Darwinian evolution. So imagine you have a B cell that interacts with, um, you know, pathogen uh, with some affinity. So it's sort of marginally okay. Then what can happen to this B cell is there are some centers, uh, dynamical sort of units that can be uh, that that can start inside lymph nodes. They're called germinal centers, and uh, you can take the antigens there and the B cells can migrate there. And this, this process of affinity maturation can start. So this is a process that involves mutating the receptors and also selecting for receptors. So you generate quite a bit of diversity by somatically mutating receptors. And this is a mutation rate that has orders of magnitude larger than uh, human genome mutation rate. And so you generate these mutations and then you select upon this diversity. And as a result of that, you build up these lineages that are related to each other. So you start up from this naive receptor and you mutate it and you select it, you generate these lineages of cells that have a slightly different receptors from each other, but they all started from a common ancestor. So it's something like evolutionary tree. This is actually an evolutionary tree we built from a lineage reader constructed in a, uh, from antibody or B cell repertoire um, of an HIV patient, so one of them. And you have tens of thousands of these lineages in, uh, in your body. So this is, this is a sort of an interesting process. A lot of these things coexist at the same time. It's not that, it's not that you only keep the best one. You can, you, you can also restart the affinity uh, process halfway. Let's say you trigger a memory, and this cell is a memory cell, so it can start its own sub lineage. So, Armita, these are sort of all this. Question. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm curious if, uh, if uh, one of these cells binds better, does that lead mm -hmm. somehow to higher proliferation? Because somehow that would be the the equivalent of yeah. selection, you know, or, or fit yeah. higher fitness. And I, I guess I don't understand well enough the feedback or whatever that would lead to that. But first of all, is that factually true? And then if it is factually true. true, can you just give a thumbnail sketch of what the, the underpinnings of that yeah. is? So what happens is that in the lymph node, uh, so for B cells to start actually working, they need um, T cell help. So if a B cell has a higher affinity to an antigen, it sort of attracts more T cell help. And that uh, triggers a stronger response and a stronger proliferation. So what happens, uh, these B cells is not mutating in one region of, of the lymph node. The mutants go to another region and they basically compete primarily for, uh, for attracting T cell help but also compete for binding to the presented antigen. There are like finite amount of antigens in this germinal center. So whoever is better at doing this uh, gets a stronger signal and it starts proliferating. And so this goes on, on and on. So even if you're a good receptor, you can go back to the mutation zone and mutate more and come back. And so there's more of you because of proliferation. And so this basically triggers this whole yeah, Darwinian mutation selection process that goes on. Um, and not all the cells that are selected are super high affinity. You can secret, so there's a, there's a topic I'm not gonna talk about today, but um, there's an interesting thing that memory cells are actually have lower affinity. So in this process, you can also memory versus plasma, it's cell differentiation and sulfate decision-making. And so it turns out that there's a whole regulatory pro process involved in this to select memory cells that are of lower affinity. So in the beginning of process, you generate more memory. And at the end, when the affinities are very high, you generate plasma cells that are then are antibody factories basically, and they go and battle that pathogen at that, at that given infection. So with this process, you can increase the affinity up to a thousand fold in principle uh, over two weeks. So germinal centers live for two weeks more than So uh, somebody had a question which uh, 
I think it was, what's the time scale which these B cells, they say mutate. Uh, I don't know if they're talking about maturation or if they're actually talking about the, you know, the proliferation of different variants. And then yeah, so uh, then there's yeah. a, sorry, let me just tell you another one, which was, um, are beneficial mutations common or are deleterious neutral mutations more common as is the case in traditional evolutionary dynamics? I like that question from Zeshen. So yep. there you go. Yeah. Well, we, so yeah, so germinal centers live for two weeks, um, more or less. There, there's, well, there are a lot of signals that basically um, control germinal centers. And I think how much of a hard evidence is out there, I, I'm not sure. Uh, there are some uh, speculations that you kind of want to limit the amount of germinal centers for for, to, to limit a lot of cellular proliferation. So you don't want sort of cancerous dynamics going on. You don't want uh, starting sort of generating autoimmune receptors. So all these things, you kind of need to limit the system. Um, so yeah, there are, there are signaling factors involved that basically define, uh, determine how long the, the process can go on. Uh, in terms of beneficial deleterious, yes. Yeah, so the majority of mutations are deleterious, um, in the, or neutral. Most of them, a lot of in a lot of neutral mutations. So I'm gonna show a little bit of sort of structure of antibodies in uh, in a few slides from now. Uh, a lot of mutations that happen in the framework or stem of the antibody. So these are sort of uh, regions in the antibody that stabilize the structure. Um, so those mutations are are mainly deleterious, and these are um, part, these are pretty long parts of the antibody. Uh, the mutations that happen in um, what's called the CDR regions of antibodies that are antigen uh, reactive parts of the antibody. They are less deleterious. But if you randomly mutate an antibody, you can easily destroy the structure. The mutation process is not fully random. Uh, it, the mutation rate uh, increases close to the sort of the CDR region and sort of decays as you go away. Uh, so the rate, I think, is about um, 10 to 5 times larger than human mutation rates. So it's a 10 to the minus 3 per uh, nucleotide. Um, per generation, and you can go over many rounds of generation during this uh, two weeks of process. So that's more or less the, the timeline. Uh, so it, it happens with this, um, this sort of error-prone enzyme, AID enzyme, um, and sort of it just sprinkles in mutations with some sequence-dependent biases that you can learn from data, I hope that answered more or less some of the biology. <laughs> um, okay. So there are many, many sort of interesting data coming from um, uh, studying immune system and immune responses. Uh, I'm gonna talk about a lot of sequence data, but um, a lot of work on uh, microscopy work is done in this field that, that are really beautiful. And so um, this is very precise experiments that come from uh, Gabriel Victoria's lab at Rockefeller. Um, so they used this brown, um, brain bow mouse that was um, developed for uh, neuroscience studies. And so you can, uh, you can basically insert this GFB molecules in there and do, by using combinatorics, you can express different colors for different cells and these colors are heritable. So the sort of uh, the descendants of that cell and the progeny of the cell would have the same color. So that's basically what we are seeing here. Um, this is a germinal center, um, sorry, a lymph node. And these are little germinal centers inside the lymph node. And they, this is a mouse model and they infected the mouse with some model antigen. And they basically um, tagged uh, B cells in mouse with these colors. So initially you can see uh, that there's quite a bit of diversity in colors of B cells at day three after infection at the two germinal centers here. If you wait for a little bit, day 15, 
Uh, what you can see is, uh, so this, these are sort of deeper view of this little germinal center. Some of the germinal centers basically are occupied what, by one type of B cell or its mutant forms, right? Uh, so D2, for example. And then some, some others are a little bit more diverse, but still you can see a strong clonal selection in the sort of type of B cell and also a lot of competition. So you can in principle have uh, within and between germinal center competition during this affinity maturation because cells can also migrate between germinal centers. Then you can wait for a little bit longer, uh, I don't know, a few months, and then reinfect the mouse again with the same antigen. So this is for reinfection. Uh, so you, you kept a bunch of these cells of memory and they can come back and trigger a response. This is, I think, left leg and right leg or the other way around. So it's also spatially different a bit, but things move. Um, and, uh, but you can both produce memory response and also a novel response and they can compete with each other. Uh, so you can generate a completely new response or you can just you know, recruit memory cells and they proliferate, pro proliferate and make also new variants. So we have a lot of things that look really like asexual population genetics, um, evolution of asexual populations. We have clonal competition, things like clonal interference and I'm gonna talk about these things and trying to sort of infer these things, uh, these uh, processes from data. Okay. So I've been talking about data. So let's say, well, let, let me tell you a little bit of like the structure of the data and how, how do we sort of on high levels, how do we go about um, analyzing our data? So let's say you have a, example of immune repertoires. Uh, so you can go and sequence these receptors of B cells or T cells. Uh, let's say you have, uh, this is a setup we used for our COVID study, for example. So we had a bunch of healthy individuals and a bunch of infected individuals at different, with different severity of disease, for example. And uh, in this case, uh, so each individual or each cell, you know, uh, we are diploid, so we have two chromosomes. Uh, the way that these receptors are generated um, is that you try out on one of the chromosomes first, and there's a good likelihood that you produce a receptor by this VDJ recombination, insertion and deletion, you produce a receptor that's out of frame, is unfunctional, and um, that's kind of faulty and you don't want to use it. You have a second go uh, on the second chromosome, and if that works, you can keep the unproductive receptor also in the nucleus uh, and would basically hitchhike together with the functional receptor. Now, if you go and sequence the repertoire, you sequence these unproductive receptors as well because they're there. Uh, the good thing about them is that they have never gone on to any selection process. These receptors, you know, they're never expressed. So you can actually learn the baseline model of receptor generation from these unproductive repertoires. That's very helpful. They happen to also get mutated uh, with the same machinery. So you can also learn biases of mutations from these things. The only thing they have is like they have a stop code maybe somewhere. But in principle, you can use these receptors to infer biases of V gene, J gene, D gene usage, how they are used together. And that's what um, people do. Uh, our collaborators uh, use these sort of receptor generation models uh, to, to characterize a generation, biases of generation process. Uh, and that's more or less what, as, as far as I go about the, the biases of generation process, um, but that's, uh, that's another talk on its own. Uh, and, and so you sort of learn these things by statistical, statistical inference. Um, so, uh, for that, you can sh uh, you can uh, you can read the paper by um, Quentin Marco and the work of group of Alexander Volchuk and Thierry Mora uh, that we are sort of close collaborators. Um, now, 
Um, productive repertoires give you a baseline for um, for generation, but receptors, you know, the first step of receptor uh, function selection is, you know, thymic selection or central tolerance in B cells. Um, and that has a sort of strong sequence specific um, biases. So certain sequences are very better, more, um, more functionally fit than others just to be immune receptors, even before reaction to any pathogen. And you can also infer those sequence features. So here, basically a basic model of sequence selection. You try to infer the probability that the sequence sigma is uh, observed in the repertoire of, in a functional repertoire, and you relate that to the probability that this sequence is initially generated and weigh the generation probability by selection factor uh, or e to some sum of selection factors uh, that sum over all the features. And features can be you know, the identity of the amino acid in the CDR3 region. That's the very specific pathogen reacting, re reactive region of the receptors where and it's between these two junctions, so you have a lot of variation in CDR3. The V gene region and the J gene identity and the length of CDR3. So um, the, the features basically contribute differently to different uh, selection factors, and that's what you can learn from statistical inference. So when you put all these things together, uh, you can first of all infer a model, second, you can character, if I give you a sequence based on that model, you can tell me what's the probability of uh, selecting that sequence, let's say, for entering to periphery. And that's the distribution that I'm showing here. Uh, this is, let's look at one of them. Uh, let's look at the blue one. So this is the data again from this study of COVID patients. The blue one is from the healthy uh, control cohort. And if you look at this distribution, what you can see is that the, um, all right, so the PDF goes over the repertoire of healthy patients, healthy individuals. And on the x axis, you, it's a logarithm of this probability of gen, uh, selecting each receptor. And as you can see, is that this probability goes over 30 orders of magnitude. So that means that there are receptors that are circulating around, that are extremely rare, and you have this long tail of rare receptors. So you have many, many rare receptors, and also you have some very common receptors. And so that's the sort of feature of repertoires, and you can do it in many data sets, and you keep producing this uh, distribution. And it seems to be you know, how the machinery works you produce a lot of individualized receptors and also a whole bunch of very common receptors that, you, that are probably very well shared among individuals. The point that I wanted to make, for example, from this plot, like the thing that you can see here is that if you look at patients, in, in this pa case, COVID-19 patients of different severity of symptoms, um, you see that there is a little bit of a boost in expression of these um, rare receptors in these patients. And that was kind of interesting that we took and tried to analyze uh, in more detail. Armita, uh, we have two yep. questions which are basically talking about the same thing. So um, the, the question is, what kind of a measurement gives you 30 orders of magnitude worth of, of resolution? And part two to that question, is how do you have to seek, how deep do you have to sequence to get something in the tail if they are so extremely rare? Yep. rare? So, you know, it's, it's about the dynamic range. So um, yeah, I, I'm on board with the questions. I'd love to hear your thought about it. Yeah, so, uh, okay. So the let, let, let's, let's talk about second question because it's fascinating. So if you go, and I think this is an example Feynman gave once, like if you go around and for a license plate and you see a specific license plate and you ask what's the probability of seeing that license plate, it's really, really low, that specific one. But you see a license plate. So, and you see many of these basically unique license plates. So whatever it is, you can, you can, you can see it. 
And there are many of them. And uh, that's basically what, what it is at the end of the day. You generate a receptor and some of them are more rare than the others. That means the rare ones are not shared among individuals, but you can still generate them. Yeah, I, so, uh, I, thought, do you, I thought that. So you, you see some license plates, but you know you don't ever see 10 to the 30th copies of any license plate. <laughs> Yeah, so, so we are not. So this is this is really not okay. So this is the first question, right? How do you compute these things that go to ten to the minus thirty? Uh, and the answer to this is that this is not based on the frequency of a receptor. Indeed, what we learn is from the. Uh, so you you learn a model. That's why you you need a model for this process. You can't go and just count receptors. First of all, it's technically difficult to do that uh, because of biases of experiments. Uh, I'm not going to go into this, but we learned these models from unique sequences. So there's no information whatsoever about um, frequency of each receptor. What you are trying to learn here is um, trying to learn contributions from different features of these receptors um, into this probability of generating them. So you have many examples of a given V gene, for example, appearing across many, many different receptors. So the data usually that we train these things on uh, is about 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5, if you're lucky, 10 to the 6 receptors from one individual, right? Uh, so in this data, for a given, given receptor is rare, but given V gene usage is not rare. So you sort of end up building a model that is factorized across these features and you learn contributions of these factors. You can think about it in physics. So this QFs, for example, here is the selection contributions, but generation probability has also a specific structure that is put in knowing how the machinery works. The biases that you have from having a specific V and D gene together, having a specific J and D gene together, uh, the length of CDO3 and all on, right? So those biases you can learn. And overall, what you end up producing is um, a model of this receptor and contributions of these features. Now, if I give you a receptor and tell you these are all the features that, that are present in this receptor, then you can go back and add up those contributions and produce a probability of generation. That's, what, that's what these, how these numbers come about. Uh, it's not about, you know, what's the probability of seeing this in the repertoire. It's about, you know, a weight that you can give it, uh, give a receptor. Um, so that's, that's where, where, where the numbers come from. Is that clear? Uh, yeah, that, that was helpful. I mean, there's, there's definitely more to think about, but uh, that was, yeah, that yep. was definitely yep. helpful. Um, I guess, well, let me so, just ask the last question that was sitting here. So. Is there a mechanism yeah. to bias VDJ recombination to get productive in-frame insertions deletions, or are the unproductive receptors useful for ensuring that each cell only expresses one receptor and undergoes proper self non-self selection? So that's a good question too. Right, so unproductive receptors are generated more or less with the frequency you expect, right? So you can, you know, you can make out of frame by just randomly putting things, you know, not having the right length between you know all this shifting frames because all these things happen at the nucleotide level so if you don't do multiple of three then it's out of frame so if out of uh, if your unproductive is not generated uh, like the first go is right you're not going to go for the second try you just keep the first try it's just give the cells a chance of using it um it doesn't contribute to self non self discrimination as long as as far as i know um, maybe it does in some levels but it's it's really not expressed at all um, and the good thing about it is you can use it as baseline so for us it's a, a statistical convenience rather than a functional convenience hey armida okay. uh, um, yep. we've been I we've been asking can you hear me Yep. Do I have ah. five minutes? Is that true? No. Well, I, I was going to tell you we've been asking we've been asking you lots of questions, so I think we have an order like we should plan on being done at ten ten at the latest. 
10, 10. Okay, yeah. maybe I should talk about some of the research we did. This is all background so far. Um, okay, let's let's see how far we can go. But don't feel badly. I mean, at least for me, at least for me, uh, I can't speak for anyone else. But I actually thought this was incredibly helpful and clear, and I actually learned more, way more about the system than I almost ever have. So I don't know. And that's that, that, that was the goal. I think that's useful. That's good. Yeah, I mean, that was remember, the goal. So let's. This is part of a course. It's. I mean, ultimately, this is really part of a course. So I think you're doing great. Right. Good. So let let's see if I can tell about some of the work that. Uh, incredible people in my group that um, all right so I mentioned these processes of generation so that gives you basically it's a statistical power to look at even a snapshot of a, uh, a repertoire and tell me something about you know how rare a receptor is and whether certain features are more abundant in one cohort of individuals uh, infected with something compared to others but the, the sort of repertoire level characterization is very coarse grain and in some ways limited. The other thing that you can look at, you can look at the dynamics of repertoires. And that would be the focus of my talk if this talk continues for longer. But that's the thing that I think gives quite a bit of um, sort of power in um, following up with the evolutionary and response of these, uh, these lineages. Uh, and dynamics can be on short term and long term, and we study both types. Um, short term dynamics, um, COVID, uh, uh, responding to COVID would be one example of that. It's a very relatively short time, and you see ex expansion and contraction of um, uh, B cell lineages during this time. And you can try to build up uh, sort of principled statistical methods to try and identify those expansions. Uh, given the baseline amount of enormous amount of noise that we have in the data. The other sort of way of thinking about it is the long-term dynamics, and that's basically you know, response to HIV. And there you have a different toolbox to play with because you can follow mutations that happen, let's say, over years of infection. And that gives you a directionality in time. And so you can really view repertoire response to HIV, like evolution of bacteria or something, right? So you can really think about it on evolutionary time scales and borrow a lot of um, ways of thinking about this problem from asexual evolutionary processes. Uh, the difference is that this is not really a single lineage evolution, rather it's an ecology of these lineages because we have about 10 to the four of them in our body and uh, not all of them are responding to the same pathogen, but they share some commonalities. And uh, that's sort of the caveat of this um, process that makes it distinct from uh, what we know in asexual populations. Uh, and lastly, um, the thing that I wasn't planning to talk and I'm for sure not gonna talk about it is about sharing of BCR clones and if you compare two repertoires, how much sharing you have, watch which receptors are shared. And in particular, if you can identify rare receptors that are shared among many individuals that are infected with some, some virus, let's say SARS-CoV-2, and that's what we did, uh, there's a good likelihood that these, um, these receptors are doing the same function because otherwise it's hard to generate them many multiple times independently in different individuals. So that gives you a sort of an entry to asking more specifically about function rather than just a statistical view of the whole repertoire. Okay. We need all of these components to uh, try and predict a response to a pathogen and to build basically models that tell us how far an immune repertoire is capable of following an infection or evolving virus. Um, so sort of the way we are going. Um, all right. I will tell you briefly about short-term dynamics um, and the recent analysis we did in COVID patients. Uh, so we had uh, around 20 patient data from 20 patients with different severity of symptoms. 
and uh, we had sequences during the infections, so up to um, yeah, so about two months of infection, more or less. Um, and so we had multiple samples from one individual. And what you can see in basic levels is basically um, this, this is some proxy for binding affinity of the plasma of these patients to uh, a specific receptor binding domain of SARS-CoV-2, which you can experimentally go and measure. And we see, you know, increases in binding affinity over time which is a good thing and it's something you would expect. And this is two types of antibody isotypes, which I'm not gonna go into it, IgM and IgG. The surprising part is that they start at the same time and end more or less similarly, and they both increase, which usually doesn't happen. So that's sort of a puzzle about COVID. Uh, but uh, we see affinity increase. Now, and and what, Armida, sorry, the, the binding level, that's a linear measure of binding? Uh, it's optical density of how much something is bound or not. I, uh, it's a binding probability in principle, so it's, it's a binding not probability. linear. Okay. Yeah, yeah, because, you know, it's optical so, okay. density at the end. Yeah. I see, I see. Okay, got it. Thank you. Um, all right, so this is the just phenotypic level at the whole level, at the plasma, right? Uh, so very coarse grain. One thing we can do is we can go ahead and build up lineages of these repertoires and, you know, a few thousand per individual. This is a sample of, you know, of a bunch of individuals that I'm showing here. And each point shows you uh, what the sort of, if you take, so if you cut through here, early versus late time point, and you ask um, basically uh, how many sequences you have at the early time point and how many sequences you got at the late time point. And you normalize it appropriately for dealing with, you know, biases in the data. Uh, so fraction, early, fraction, late. So X axis is early, Y axis is late. So the things that are above the diagonal uh, basically should tell you the ones that have expanded over time. These are lineages that have expanded. Now we have a lot of noise, so you need to cook up some statistical tests. And if you if you sort of do do your um, do your math, what you end up seeing is that there you can identify these red lineages here that. I can tell you they have significantly expanded over time. So that's a good proxy of response, supposedly, um, for lineages that are responding to something, right? During infection, and there's a severe infection going on in a patient, it's a COVID infection. So we would think that these are probably responding to COVID. Now, the number here uh, tells me that about you know, up to 15% of lineages in one individual is, are responding to, to an infection. Um, that's a bit too high. Um, and I really don't know why. And we, you do analysis of expansion of lineages to influenza infection or various things, you get about the same number. Uh, so if you go and really do functional assays of the blood, um, and try to fish out antibodies that are really res um, responding to that pathogen, the number doesn't go above, doesn't even reach 1% of the blood um, and or plasma. So the 15% is an order of magnitude off and we actually don't know why and it keeps coming up. So it seems that things just expand without probably responding. So expansion on its own is not really a good measure of um, response. And you need to implement this with other statistical measures to get something useful out of it. But I still think it's quite interesting how much dynamics we have during just a basic acute response to an infection. Okay, so... Let me give you also five minutes of HIV <laughs> evolution. Um, and so everything so far I talked about was short-term. So 
maximum a month. And I'm gonna go into a time scale of a few years. And this is a study that we did um, a, two years ago. Uh, so it's about intrapatient evolution of HIV, co-evolution of HIV with, uh, with immune system. And what I'm gonna tell you in this slide is some sort of time a life cycle of HIV and how it evolves very fast. But I think the punchline from the slide that you should get is during chronic phase of HIV infection, where the virus basically lives, happily, lives in the patient, and maybe the patient is not very sick before AIDS, the evolution of virus is pretty rapid. There's an evolutionary tree of uh, HIV, envelope protein, and you can see about 8% of intrapatient divergence in about 10 years overall, when you look at many data, so this is over two and a half years. Um, and this is a number that is comparable to influenza evolution globally or larger than that. So it's about 20%, 20 years of influenza evolution. It's a large number. Uh, and that means that's, what, that's basically the reason we don't have a vaccine against HIV because you would have to update the vaccine the usual vaccines um, every few weeks. Uh, and the reason that we get these large divergences is basically the large mutation rate, large population size of the virus, and also short generation time within individual. Now on the immune system part, um, so we looked at also repertoire data and try to understand dynamics of these um, uh, repertoires over time. Uh, and this was a study we did on six HIV infected individuals for two and a half years of infection, uh, untreated and treat, uh, individuals with interrupted treatment. And so uh, some, so you build lineages, you build trees, and these trees are now meaningful because they're very long over these two years. And you can really try and track mutations. And that's what we did. We, um, instead of looking at expansions, like just what we did in a COVID case, we used these mutations to guide us through time because they mark the direction of time. And we treated mutations differently in different regions of the receptor. As I mentioned before, framework regions are known um, to stabilize the antibodies, for example. And so mutations there happen to, are supposed to be deleterious and that's what we inferred. Uh, in CDR regions, different parts of CDRs, there are pathogen engaging and a lot of beneficial mutations get fixed in these regions. And that's also what we saw. And the beauty of these data and the studies is once you start looking at things over a long period of time, you can really build an evolutionary model. And I'm gonna skip all this. Um, this was a long talk. Um, all right, so one thing uh, we saw, and I'm not gonna motivate it and you need to take my word for it, as we managed to infer basically a fitness landscape for, for these uh, evolutionary process of the repertoire. And that was an interesting thing because you would think, okay, there are some mutations that are under selection and that's it. But what we saw is that there's quite a bit of turnover in evolutionary trajectories. A mutation can go up and then go down. And that's the thing called, you know, remind you of clonal interference. And if you were to model this sort of frequency of these mutations or frequency trajectories, you end up uh, finding a model that best describes the data. And it's a model that has a selection associated with the receptors plus some short-term fluctuations and long-term flips. So we call this a micro and macro evolutionary fluctuation. So the, the green line here is um, basically the strength of selection over time. So a schematic, but just to tell you what I mean by micro and macro, so you have a baseline selection coefficient. And so here is a high selection. Uh, the frequency at this level of your favorable allele is high. And then the selection can flip. Um, and the flips can be due to many things. It can be due to um, 
a virus mutated in your way, escaping. So the mutation that was beneficial before is not anymore. Or it can be because there's other mutants that showed up in the population. And effectively, because what matters is the difference in selection, effectively the mutant you're looking at has lower fitness. So you we're get gonna flip to, uh, and you we're, we're gonna have to wrap up um, pretty quick. Yep. I'm sorry to say. Okay. That's fine. Um, so, so basically what we are seeing here is uh, a fluctuating environment that would describe evolution of repertoires in HIV patients. And the fact that what we see is um, a selection strength that infer in repertoires to correlate quite well with the amount of viral load change in patients or that is a proxy of HIV evolutionary rate. So in a way, we have a piece of repertoire that seems to chase HIV evolution with rates or beneficial rates that kind of um, trace how much HIV evolution we have in your repertoire. Um, so this is all published this, uh, this last part. If you're interested, uh, go ahead and read it here. Uh, just to wrap up, um, Basically, I tried to build a picture for you that we need a statistical inference to find repertoire determinants of function. Uh, we can look at short-term dynamics and long-term dynamics of repertoires. And depending on the type of data you're looking at, you get different flavors of immune response. Um, and uh, you will see basically interlineage positive selection on CDR regions, negative selection on framework regions, macro and micro evolutionary fluctuations and the strong selection or interference of visa repertoires in HIV, which resembles a lot asexual evolution um, in microbes, for example. Um, yeah, with this, I'd like to thank all the people who helped me do this. Um, so this is our group. Um, and uh, people here in blue are the ones who worked on the COVID um, analysis and the work uh, on the HIV part is, was in collaboration with our collaborators, Alex Wolchuk, Karen Mora, and Marcel Buksha, and Jakub Atanovsky was uh, involved in all of this analysis. And thank you for getting through Zoom. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. That was a lot of fun. I learned a lot. So um, there's a couple of que questions. First of all, Phil Nelson was hoping that you might be able to put some of the references in the skip slides into the chat. I'm not sure how workable sure. that is, but I'm sure. maybe you could, if that doesn't work, maybe you can send in the mail. <laughs> with, you know, I don't know if you want to send the slides or just uh, the key references that you were in the skip slides that went by fast. I can send uh, you the slides. I don't know if you have, you can upload it somewhere, right? Yeah, if you send us the slides, we can put them on the website, actually. That would all be right. one idea. Yeah. 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 So uh, Brandon is wondering, what do you see the GC imaging data bringing to the table for quantitative analysis? So there's a question for you. Right. So the GC, the GC imaging, you can do it over time and you can, you can try to build histories out of it. And mm -hmm. people have done that. So this person who is our collaborator, Will David and Eric Matson. They have looked at this GC imaging data and there's a wonderful paper they wrote in uh, MBE a few years back, uh, trying to reconstruct lineages of these um, yeah, image data. The interesting thing they found there is evolution in this short snapshots, at least in the model system of mouse, because they knocked out a lot of things in the mouse to, to be able to do this. This, it seemed pretty neutral. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So, and there, were, there weren't a lot of mutations popping up. So maybe, I know that um, the Victoria lab is doing more of these experiments and um, probably they can build something a slightly more realistic setup. And, uh, but overall, I think it's super cool to follow it. Follow okay. this, yeah, rainbow. Um, actually, so I think we're gonna stick to our usual prescription of stopping at 1015, so. Um, so Sounds good. Like, yeah, love to thank you again for a really super interesting talk. And like I said, I learned a lot. Um, just for everybody that's left, uh, I want to mention tomorrow is uh, Thomas Lequy 
from Marseille, and he's going to talk about morphogenesis and mechanics and gene expression. It should be a lot of fun. Uh, otherwise, I uh, hope everyone has a great day. Take care. Thanks, Thanks again, Armida. Great talk. Thanks. <laughs> and yeah, send, send us a slide if, if you want us to post them. Yeah, I'll, okay. yeah, Even if it's I'll a PDF do it. Or something.